Hello there, thanks for watching and I appreciate you. This is a video in a series of videos showing you how to make a custom character controller that uses rigid body physics, sim machine cameras, Unity's new input system, and custom player gravity. In last video, we introduced some stair handling into our character controller. In this video, we're going to give our player the ability to crouch. We have our project open here, and as usual, this project is exactly how we left it in the last video. So if you're following along with this series, then there should be no surprises. Now with that said, let's get some stuff done. As usual, whenever there is something that we're adding that requires new player input, then we'll go ahead and set that up first. To do that, we're going to start in our project panel down the bottom left corner. We're going to click on scripts, input, and we're going to open up our input actions. In our input actions, we need to think about what are we trying to add here. We're trying to add the ability to crouch. That's going to be a button that we're going to hold and press, and for the duration of the press, we're going to stay crouched. And what that means is we can set up this input exactly how we set up the input for our ability to run. So for all intents and purposes, we can just take our run ability here and we can just copy exactly what we have here. And with a copied, you can see that all it is is an action type of value, control type any. And we're going to right click on it and rename it. We're going to call it crouch because this is our crouch input action. And let's drop it down. And for our bindings, we're going to set our gamepad control to our button west. And for our keyboard, we're just going to click listen here, and we're going to use the left control key. Of course, you can set these whatever you like. This is what I'm going to use. Don't forget to save your asset. And now we're done here. Now we've got the input action added. Let's go ahead and head over to our humanoid land input script. So same thing down in our project panel. Let's double click on humanoid land input. And in here again, I'm just going to copy everything we have for our run input and rename it to be relevant to our crouch. Let's just take a second real quick to review what I just did. Again, I just copied our run is pressed here, which we're set in a public boolean called crouch is pressed, and we can get it from anywhere, but we can only set it locally, and by default, its value is going to be false. Next, if we scroll down in our on enable function, again, this is the exact same way we're handling our run input. We're just renaming everything to crouch, but in our on enable, we're gonna start listening to when we start pressing the button and when we stop pressing the button. And when we start pressing and when we stop pressing, we're going to go ahead and we're going to call the set crouch event handler. So now that we're subscribed to these events, we can scroll down to the on disable function. And in the on disable function, we're making sure we are also unsubscribing from these events. And then finally, in the set crouch event handler, if we scroll down just a little bit further, again, same thing as the run, we're just checking to see if our context of the input event is started, then crouch's press is going to equal to true. Otherwise, it's going to equal false. So basically what this means, if we start pressing the button, then crouches press is going to equals true. As soon as it's canceled, it goes in that canceled listening event. It's no longer going to be started equals true. Start is going to equal false. So this is a very, very simple Boolean swap that we're doing. And I like it because it's very clean and it's very straightforward. Now we're handling our new input. We can go ahead and set up our actual character controller to actually do the crouch function. So on our project panel, we can now go to our controllers folder and we can open up our humanoid land controller script. If you've watched any of my videos before, then you probably realize that this is now the time where I'm just going to go ahead and type in all the changes that we need to make. So I'll go ahead and start doing that now. After I'm done typing this in, as usual, we'll do a very light, very quick review of every line that I've changed. That way you can easily follow along with this if that's what you're trying to do. And right after that, we'll go into a playtest to demonstrate that it actually works and how it works. And then we'll go into a more in-depth look at the code and I'll explain exactly what we're doing and why we're doing that. And since we have a little bit of time right now, I just want to go ahead and thank you for watching. I really hope that you find this helpful, and if you do, it would be really helpful to me. If you would like the video, subscribe and or comment down below. These videos do take a lot of time and effort, and any and all support is greatly appreciated. So, while I'm typing this in, if you would just take a moment to do that now, I'd greatly, greatly appreciate it. Thank you.
Okay, now that we have that done, we can go ahead and review the changes that we made. We're not going to talk about the code itself necessarily too much just yet. We'll go over that more in depth later. Right now, I just want to highlight the actual changes that we made so that those who are actually following along can actually duplicate what we're doing here. So without further ado, let's go ahead and start it out. We made one change here in the movement section. We added this line for our crouch speed multiplier. And if we scroll down, we added this entire section. We have a bunch of serializable fields. The first one's a bool. The next four are floats. We then have three more floats and a vector three. We can scroll a little bit further in our awake function at the bottom here. We're assigning values to our player full height and our player crouch type variables. And in the fix update function, we added the player variables function call, as well as the player move input equals player crouch function call. And we changed this line to be player center point instead of our rigid body position. Let's scroll down now to our player variables function that we created. Here you can see we're just setting a value to our player center point variable. And if we scroll just a little bit further, our player ground check, you'll see that in our sphere cast, we actually changed our sphere cast origination point from our rigid body position to our player center point. And if we scroll a little bit further, we're actually going to do that a lot here in our ascend stairs and descend stairs functions or our vector three ray lowers and uppers. We want to update all of our rigid body positions within these two vector threes to our player's center point. Again, for the descend stairs function as well, we want to make sure we update our ray lower and ray upper. Any reference to the rigid body position should be updated to our player center point variable. Also in our player slope function, we want to make sure that we update our ray calculate ray height and our vector three ray origin. Any reference for our rigid body position in these two should also be updated to our player center point. Finally, we'll scroll down to our actual player crouch function and get into the meat and potatoes of this. Here is our player crouch function and our actual crouch function. Next, we have our uncrouch function as well as our enforce exact char height function. And finally, if we scroll down just a little bit further, we have one little change here. I didn't want to be able to run crouch. So if you want to be able to run crouch, you can just leave it as is, that's fine. But I didn't want to be able to run crouch. So in this line here, I added our and not player is crouching. And that's it as far as the code that we need to change. So if you missed any of it, go on back, pause the video, get the code that you need. Otherwise, let's jump on over to Unity and see how it all works. Okay, we're back in Unity now, but before we do our play test, I just want to take a second to actually add some game objects for our player to crouch underneath. So let's go ahead and let's do that. Quick, while I'm doing this, I want to take a moment to once again thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please ask them in the comments below. I hope you find these videos helpful enough to like the video and maybe even subscribe to my channel. It helps a lot and also encourages me to keep creating these videos. So help me help you by liking and subscribing right now. Thanks. All right, that's simple enough. That should do nicely. Let's go ahead and let's start our play test then. And if I press the crouch button, you see we get a nice smooth animation downwards. And if I let go, we'll get a nice smooth animation upwards as well. So if I crouch once again and I try to move, you'll see we move very, very slowly. If I uncrouch, you'll see we go back to full speed. Again, we'll do it while running. If I crouch, you see we slow right down. And if I uncrouch, we go back to running. All right, next we have these floating game objects that we just added. And if we stand right next to them, you'll see that they are lower than our player's height. We cannot pass under them, even if we try. If I crouch, however, we can go under them. And you'll see that there's a little bit of headroom here. There is a headroom check being performed. And if I try to uncrouch, we'll only uncrouch as far as we can. You can see that here I've uncrouched and there's ever so slightly a space between us and the object or our player's head and the object rather. And if I move out from underneath the object, you'll see we automatically uncrouch because I am no longer pressing the crouch button. So if we go back under and we go to this lower game object, you'll see we cannot pass under that while I am not pressing the crouch button. However, if I press the crouch button, we can just narrowly squeeze on through. And if I let go of the crouch button, you'll see we do not go up into the object, but rather we stay crouched until we clear the object. But yeah, I think that's a pretty good demo of our ability to crouch. Let's go ahead and let's go back to the code and let's take a very in-depth look of what exactly we're doing and why we're doing it. In our code, right off the bat, we have a serializable field. It's a float and it's called crouch speed multiplier with a default value of 0 0.5. 
It's pretty self-evident what exactly this does. It modifies our player's force while our player is crouched. In this case, reducing our force in half. Quick side note, it would be far more consistent, accurate, and descriptive if we were to name these variables the same as we did with the first one. So instead of calling them speed multipliers, or just multiplier in general like we did with run, we should actually call them a movement multiplier. Why? Because we're not actually directly affecting our player's speed or velocity, but rather we're affecting the force that's being applied to our character. But that's just nitpicking, let's move on. We spent enough time on one variable. Here we have all of our other crouching variables which we just added. We'll just glance over them real quick and touch base on them lightly. Most of them will be better to discuss later when they're actually being used. So first we have five serializable fields. The first one is a boolean called player is crouching and we're setting its default value to false. As the name would suggest, we're using this value to track from physics frame to physics frame whether our player is crouching or not. The next one is a float called head check radius multiplier and its default value is 0.9. This is just like our ground check radius multiplier. So if you're familiar with that video, if you've already seen that video, then you'll know exactly what this does. If not, I strongly suggest you go back and watch that video. This is what this video looks like here. After the head check radius multiplier, we then have our crouch time multiplier, default value is 10.0. Next, we have our player crouch height tolerance, its default value is 0.05. And finally, we have a crouch mount counter, its default value is 0.0. As for non-serializable fields, we have three more floats and a vector 3. The first float is called crouch amount, its default value is 1.0. This is, as the name suggests, the amount we are going to crouch when we are crouching. So our player height is currently 3 meters or 3 units, and since we have our crouch amount sent to 1.0 or 1 unit or 1 meter, our total crouched height will be 2 meters or 2 units. Next we have our player full height and our player crouched height, we'll talk more about them later. Right now their default values are set to 0.0. .0. And finally we have our vector 3 player center point, its default value is a vector 3.0, and once again we'll talk about that later. Moving right along, let's scroll down just a little bit further here. In our awake function, we want to make sure that we cache our player's height. So in our awake function, before we go changing our player's height, we want to know what our player's height is supposed to be originally. A simple method of doing that is just doing it once when the script is in the awake state. And that's exactly what we're doing here. We're saying our player full height equals our capsule collider height. And likewise, just to keep things simple, we're also going to calculate our player crouch height, which is going to be our player's full height minus our crouch amount. So effectively, as we have things now, our player full height will be 3.0, and our player crouch height will be 2.0. Scroll down a little bit more here. If you remember, in our fix update fixes loop, we add the player variables function call, as well as our player crouch function call, and we updated our debug draw rate to now point to our player center point. Let's now move on to our player variables function, and let's talk about what we're doing here and why we're doing it. Here we have our player variables function. It's a very simple function. All we're doing is we're setting our player center point to equal our rigid body position plus our capsule collider center. Now you might be wondering why are we doing this and why is it necessary? Well, I'm going to change the screen now to a blackboard and we'll take a look at some of my lovely drawings where I will try to explain why exactly we're doing this. Alright, here we are. Sorry you didn't get to see me draw all of this. I forgot to hit the record button, but let's keep moving. In the middle, we have our player's character, which standing is 3 meters tall. And our crouch amount is 1 meter, so our crouch player on the left here is going to be 2 meters tall. I also think it's important to point out that one is happier than the other. And with that in mind, let's talk about how Unity handles resizing a capsule collider. So over on the right here, we have this capsule collider. And a capsule collider has a center point, which will be this dot right here. And when you resize a capsule collider's height in Unity, it's going to take a little bit of the height from both the top and the bottom. And that's going to look something like this. So if we're shrinking it 0.5 on both the top and bottom. It's going to look something like that. However, we don't really want that because when you crouch, you don't really take it off the top of your head or... <laughs> You don't, you're not really supposed to hunch over a whole lot. Most of it comes from your legs bending, right? So we really just want to take the height from the bottom of our player. So if we just go ahead and we take a meter off the bottom of our player, we're going to end up with something like this right here. And all that's going to go away, but our capsule collider center point here is still going to stay right here. Now the problem with this is that when we chop it all off the bottom and we don't just take the same amount from both the top and the bottom, when we only take it from one side, our rigid body's position is not going to update properly. This dot is going to basically remain the exact same spot. 
but thankfully our capsule collider keeps track of our center point and when it gets put off center we can just reference what the center actually is and we can modify our rigid body position to actually show that true center. So in this case our center is going to be a positive 0.5 on our y which just means that we need to move up half a unit to find our new center. And now if we go back and look at our code again, you'll see in our player variables function that that's exactly what we're doing. We're just saying our player center point is our rigid body position plus our capsule collider center. And we're still going to talk about this a little bit more. Let me go ahead and demonstrate to you if we jump on over in Unity. And here in Unity in our scene panel, you can see the outline, the green outline, the wireframe of our capsule collider. And when I hit the crouch button, you see that it shrinks and it all comes from the bottom. And you also see that under our capsule collider in our inspector panel that we have our center. And you'll see our Y is exactly like I said, it is 0.5. You'll also notice that our height is now 2 instead of 3. And if I stop pressing crouch, you'll see that the Y goes back to 0 and our height back to 3. Okay, we're done here. We're going to go back over to Visual Studio now. Now just to drill this a little bit more, this is pretty important to understand. You really need to know the center of your player because that's where we're sending all of our ray casts and sphere casts from. So if we don't know where our center point is and we're sending it from the wrong point, then our distances to the ground are going to be completely off and they're not going to work right, if at all. And that's why moving on to our player ground check function. In our physics sphere cast, we updated our rigid body position to our player center point here as well as any references in our player stairs function, both our ascend stairs with our ray lowers and our ray uppers. We updated them all to player center point. Obviously the same thing applies to our descend stairs function as well, and as well as our player slope function. Okay, I'm done explaining that for now. I'm glad we got through that. But let's just keep going and let's get into the meat and potatoes once again. Let's talk about our player crouch function. To start it off, we have a vector 3 called calculated player crouch speed. It's a terrible name, but we're assigning it the value of our player move input. Again, this is just that we can pass variables in and return a variable back so that I can just look at our physics loop or our main game loop and see where exactly our global variables are being modified. It helps with debugging purposes and just keeping a flow. You have to be very careful with global variables. They can get out of hand very fast. Anyway, moving right along, we have an if check to see if our input crouch is pressed, is pressed or not. If our crouch button is pressed, then we are going to go to our crouch function. Otherwise, we're going to check to see if our player is currently crouching. If our crouch is not pressed and our player is crouching, then we want to uncrouch. And at the same time, every time we're coming through, if our player is currently crouching, we want to say that our calculated player crouch speed equals our calculated crouch speed times our crouch speed multiplier. And then finally, we're going to return that calculated value back, and that's going to be our movement speed. Scrolling down just a little bit to our crouch function, this is where things start to get a little bit serious. So in our crouch function, right off the bat, we have an if check, checking to see if our capsule collider's height is greater than or equal to our player crouch height plus our player crouch height tolerance. Now I realize that sounds terribly complicated, but it's really not. You have to keep in mind that every time we come through, we want to progressively increase our crouch amount. We don't want to just instantly switch between a crouch state and uncrouch state. That would be very kind of clunky. I actually want to show you how to progressively go from a crouch state to a standing state and vice versa. But that's why this is a little more complicated. But if you hang in there, I'm sure this will make sense to you by the time we're done. So going back to it again, we're going to check to see if our height is greater than our player crouch type plus our player crouch type tolerance, which is just 0.05 and our player crouch type is 2. So if our current height of our player is greater than 2.05 units, then we're going to execute this block of code. Else, or otherwise, we're going to call our enforce exact char height function. And we'll get into what that does in just a minute as well. But going back to our main block of code up here, if our capsule collider's height is greater than or equal to our player crouch type plus our player crouch height tolerance, when we create a new variable, it will be a float and we're going to call it time. And it's going to store our time.fixedelta time times our crouch time multiplier. Next, this is a pretty lazy way of doing this and not really a proper way, but it'll give us a nice linear progression. And you could pretty easily make this non-linear, but anyways, we're creating another variable. It's a float and we're calling it amount. This is the amount that we're actually going to move or shrink our character. And we're going to use the mathf function called lerp with a starting point of 0.0, .0 an end point of our crouch amount, and for the time we're going to use our time that we just calculated based off our fixed delta time. Here we're actually doing the work. We need to change three things. We need to change our capsule collider's height. 
Our caps apply to center so we can give the illusion of taking all of our height from the bottom of our player, as well as moving our rigid body position downwards so that our gravity doesn't kick in and we get a nice smooth transition. To accomplish this, all we're going to do is we're going to subtract the amount that we just generated from our caps collider's height. For our caps collider center, we're just going to add half of our amount to our caps collider center y. And for our rigid body's position, we're just going to simply move our player downwards by subtracting the amount from our rigid body position dot y. Finally, since we're going to be in a crouching state now, we want to make sure that we're setting our player's crouching variable to true. So hopefully you got all that. If not, take a moment to digest it now. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me down in the comments. I'll be happy to get back to you. But before moving on, we'll go over this just one more time. We're going to take our caps collider's height and we're going to reduce it a small amount every physics frame so we can progressively transition from a standing state to a crouch state. We're going to shift our caps collider's center point upwards so we can give the illusion of subtracting all of our height from the bottom of our player. And now that we've shifted everything upwards, our player will actually be slightly in the air. So we also want to move our player downwards by adjusting his rigid body position. Okay, now we're going to scroll down to our uncrouch function and go over this one. This one's a little more complicated because we're implementing a head check before we uncrouch. But similarly to the crouch function, right off the bat, we're doing an if check. Now this might not be the way you want to write it, but this is the way it made sense to me. I'm using a not operand to check to see if our caps collider's height is greater than or equal to our player full height, not our crouch height, but our full height now, minus, not plus, but minus our player crouch height tolerance. So if not, our caps collider's current height is greater than or equal to our player full height minus our player crouch height tolerance. Then we're going to do this block code here, else or otherwise, we're going to set players crouching equals false, and then we're going to call our enforce exact char height function. The reason for this head check is to actually prevent a sort of spring reaction that happens when a collider over penetrates another collider. So for example, if you're trying to expand your character into a collider that's above its head, then what's going to happen is you're going to get a spring reaction to kind of push that collider out from the other collider. And what you're seeing on the screen right now is actually an example of that. If you want to experiment with this for yourself, you can go ahead and just comment out the spherecast if statement and run the game for yourself and you'll see what exactly happens. So it's just a little bit of refinement, it makes the character controller a little bit nicer, and that's why I've implemented it here. Alright, so now with that explained, moving on to the next point. There's a few things here that I found that snuck by me that are completely incorrect and I should have updated but forgot to. Not really sure how or why it got by me, but it did, so I'm going to go ahead and correct those now. First, I probably should not have this here. For me at the time, it made more sense to have this here, so I'm going to correct it now. Let's we'll go ahead and get rid of that not operand. And we'll change this to less than and get rid of the final enclosing parentheses. Next is capsule collider transform.position does not need to be here. This can just be our player center. And finally, since we're now using our player center point, we do not need any of this crouch mount stuff here. So we can just leave that out. Of course, this could always be further refined and made better, but those were actual problems. And any further refinement, I'm going to leave up to whoever wants to use this type of script in the first place. There's plenty of room for improvement, and I encourage you to improve it. All right, now we got all of that finally out of the way. We can go ahead and we can just go through this line by line like we were initially intending to. Right off the bat, in our uncrouch function, we have an if check. Check and see if our caps collider's current height is less than our player full height minus our player crouch height tolerance. So if our caps collider's current height is less than our desired height, we're going to go ahead and we're going to create a variable. It's a float and we're going to call it sphere cast radius. This is very similar to how we're doing our ground check. So once again, if you haven't seen that video, I suggest you go back and you watch that video. Here it is on your screen now. This is what it looks like. And this sphere cast radius is going to equal our caps collider radius times our head check radius multiplier. The next variable that we're creating is a float and we're calling it headroom buffer distance. We're setting its value to 0.05 and this is just a buffer that we're allowing for ourselves that goes past our player's head. That just gives us a little bit of a buffer between our player's head and the actual collider above us. Finally, we're creating one more variable. It's another float and we're calling it sphere cast travel distance. The parentheses here are really no longer needed, but I'm not going to take them out right now. But we're saying our sphere cast travel distance equals our caps collider bounds extends dot y plus our headroom buffer distance minus our sphere cast radius. Finally, we have our last if statement here, and it reads if not physics sphere cast from our player center point size of our sphere cast radius in the direction of our rich body transform up. We're not storing the hit 
and we're going to send it out as far as our sphere cast travel distance. If not our physics sphere cast hits anything, then we're going to create a variable just as before, and it's a float called time, and we're going to say it equals our time.fixedelta time times our crouch time multiplier. Additionally, we're also going to create the exact same float amount. It's going to be our mathf.lerp, 0.0f, crouch amount, and our time. I know I brushed over those real quick, but they're exactly the same as they are in the crouch function. And the next three lines are very, very similar as well. We're going to adjust our height, our caps height. We're going to add our amount as opposed to subtracting it like we are in our crouch function. For our caps center, we're going to subtract from our caps center dot y half of our amount. And finally, for our rigid body dot position, we're going to add our amount to our rigid body position dot y. So finally, that is how we uncrouch. Otherwise, if we're trying to uncrouch, but our capsule collider's height is less than our player full height minus our player crouch height tolerance, then or else or otherwise, we're going to say our player is crouching equals false. We are no longer crouching and we're going to call our enforced exact char height function. And that's it for our uncrouch function. Like I said, it's just a little bit more complicated because we have the sphere cast. Check and see if we have the headroom. That is optional. You don't have to have that there, but it does add a little nice feature to this character controller. If we now scroll down to our enforce exact char height function, you'll see that in our enforce exact char height function, if our player is crouching, then we want to set our capsule collider's height to our player full height minus our crouch amount, which we actually have a variable storing this exact value now, so that's something else I forgot to update. <laughs> I'll go ahead and I'll change that now real quick. There we go, we just set our capsule collider height to our player crouch height, which is going to be exactly 2.0. And then we're going to also set our capsule collider center exactly to where it should be, which is just affecting our Y value by half the crouch amount. Otherwise, if we are not crouching, then our capsule collider height is going to equal our player full height. So we're going to set our player full height all the way to 3. And our capsule collider center, we're going to reset that to all zeros. Now this might not seem very important, but it is actually very important because we're dealing with floating point values. If you know anything about floating point math, then you'll know that floating point values are not accurate. And there will sometimes and or most of the time actually be little variances in the actual values that come out of it. That's why floating point math is very efficient. It's not exact. It takes some shortcuts to save some CPU time so you can get results faster at the expense of accuracy. That said, if you did just use floating points and you didn't specifically set things somewhat decently like we are here, then eventually your player may very well get shorter or taller than what he essentially should be. Of course, that might take hundreds, thousands, even millions or billions of actual crouch attempts for something problematic to occur, but nonetheless, it is a glitch and something to keep in mind anytime you're dealing with floating point values. And finally, with all of that discussed, we're now on to the final change that we made, and that's in the player run function. All we did is we checked to see if our input.move is present and input.run is press and not our player is crouching, then we'll go ahead and apply our run multiplier. Of course, if you want to be able to run crouch, you could just exclude this. You don't need to have that there. I just wanted to put it there to show you how easy it was to implement. And speaking of ease of implementing things, there's one more thing I want to point out. If we scroll back up to our crouch and uncrouch functions, I just want to point out here that since we took the time to actually shrink the height effectively from the bottom of our player, that this easily allows us to implement crouch jumping into our game or project. I don't know if that's something that interests you and is something you'd want to implement in your project or not. That is completely up to you. But with how we've structured things here, it is very simple to implement at this point. And with that, we are done reviewing the code so far. I hope you found this helpful and useful. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to ask them in the comments below. This series only has a few more videos left in it. At this point in the series, you have a character controller that can navigate stairs and slopes, run, jump, and crouch, has multiple cameras that can zoom, and can interact with physics objects. Which is just a long way of saying that at this point, you have a pretty awesome character controller that should feel smooth and satisfying to play with. In the next video, I'm going to show you how to move a player with a moving and or rotating platform. That should be a pretty simple video to put together, so I hope to release that one soon. That's it for now, and as always, thanks for watching. If you're feeling generous, leave a comment down below. I want to read what you're thinking. Let me know if you have any questions or recommendations. I'd also appreciate it very much if you liked the video. And if you're feeling extra, extra generous, it'd blow my mind if you subscribe to the channel. Being new to this and putting these videos together takes a lot of time and effort. Thank you for any and all participation and support. I look forward to continuing this in the next one. See ya.